saying, I work for Smart Bear Software. Um, we are, if you haven't heard the name, if you're not familiar with the name, we are the Soap UI Swagger people. So if you know Soap UI or Swagger, uh, that's Smart Bear Software. Um, I am going to hit on the, the kind of the key pieces to a successful API, and then I'm going to talk about how do you actually get there, because I think a lot of people will tell you what you need to have in place in order to have a great API, and then they kind of leave you hanging and, and don't give you some real tactical advice. So where I'm going to kind of focus my energy in this conversation is really on some of the tactical things you need to do in order to make sure your API is ready. Um, and when I say ready, it's ready for people to consume, it's ready for people to understand, um, and it's ready for people to, to develop against. So what makes a great API? And what do you need to do to have a successful API program? You've heard it probably all day already. You need to document. So you need to make sure that people understand how to use your API. What does your API do? Um, you need to test it. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So that's something people, believe it or not, often skip. And you're going to be in trouble if you do. So you want to make sure you've allocated time to test your API. Mocking, which doesn't mean you're making fun of your API. Mocking means creating a virtual version of your API. This is an important step. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about it in depth, actually, because there's a lot to this that I think people don't really investigate that often. There's a lot of ways to mock your API. It's an important piece to do because you want people to be able to touch your API, play with it. You want them to actually have some experience with, you know, when I make this request, what kind of payload do I get back? This is how people will figure out how to test your API and how to develop against your API. So it's, it's an important piece. You need to evangelize it. I'm not saying that just because I'm an evangelist, but because if you don't market your API, we like to call it evangelism in the API world, but it's really just marketing. Um, if you don't market your API, people don't know it's there. They don't know what it does. They don't know why they should bother with it. The reality is this is a very competitive world now, the API sector. There's a lot of choices that people have when it comes to choosing an API. You want to make sure that you're promoting what you've done. And, of course, we're at the WSO2 uh, conference. You want to make sure you have the right management in place. And, and there's a lot of flavors to that. We've heard that from a lot of the WSO2 folks already today. You need to kind of evaluate where you are in your API journey and how much do you need from your API management platform. The, the, the benefit of going with something like WSO2 is that it's very flexible. So it can kind of grow with you. It can be as little as you need it to be and it can be as much as you need it to be. And you want to think about that before you choose a platform. And then, of course, you want to do some monitoring. I've been really happy to hear, I've been an advocate of API monitoring for years, so it's been very nice to hear today how many people have talked about API monitoring. Um, this is something that people haven't been really focused on for uh, the last couple of years, and just now it's starting to become much more of a conversation. It's an important part, um, and I'm going to talk about that, too, as we get through this. Okay, so those are the keys to a successful API. How do you get there? Well, first of all, you want to be able to visualize your API. When we talk about visualizing APIs, a lot of times we're referring to the documentation. Um, how many people here are actually, how many people here provide APIs now? Okay, so you've probably already had the conversations about how do you describe an API. WSO2 is a big proponent of Swagger. Um, and so there are a lot of choices. You can use Swagger, you can use API Blueprint, you can use Waddle or WSDL if you're using SOAP APIs, because not everybody's using REST. Um, lots of ways to describe an API. The reality is they are all very similar. <laughs> 
If you look at this, this isn't really visualizing your API. This is describing your API. This is pure documentation. So if I look at these, this is, this is sort of examples of all the different service formats. So uh, there's IODocs and API Blueprint and RAML and Swagger. And you can see that they are all pretty similar. And they're all text-based, which is great if you're if the conversation is developer to developer. But these days, there's a lot of people working in the API industry who are not developers. There are a lot of product managers. There are a lot of business people who are actually defining APIs or requiring APIs. So if you're an application product manager and you want certain functionality, and your, a your developer comes back and says, okay, great, I, we don't need to build that. There's an API that will do that. And then they hand you a swagger definition. Right? As a product manager, you're going to look at that swagger definition and go, okay, explain this to me. Right? What does this actually do? So that's not really, that's a, it's a great communication tool from developer to developer, but it doesn't really answer the need of visualizing that API. What does that API really do? Um, this is one of my favorite quotes, the best design gets out of the way. So if you think about things like service description formats, those are great designs if you're a developer. If you're not a developer, if you're not technical really in, in a, a coding sense, you're going to want something that really visualizes for you. So the reality is our brains are mapped for visuals. If I ask you, how do I get to Buckingham Palace, you're going to draw me a map, right? You're not going to sit there and, and give me a long list of, well, you know, go down the street and then turn right and then turn left and then go another couple of blocks. And you're not going to do that. You're going to sit there with a napkin and draw me a map because that's how we're wired. So if we look at some of the things that are starting to come out, people are starting to realize that service descriptions, because they are text-based, are not really hitting the mark. So people are coming up with some pretty clever ideas. This is only stuff that's starting to emerge in the last couple of months. Um, this is something called Swagger.ed. It is an open source uh, Chrome extension that is, of course, for Swagger. So it, basically, you can take this, you can you know, add it to your Chrome browser, when you look at an API description in Swagger, it'll generate this view for you. So now you can kind of see all of the, the kind of the surface of your API just by looking at this. It's a very quick, easy way to comprehend the capabilities of that API. But again, it's, it's more like a mind map that a developer would appreciate. I'm not sure if I had said to somebody, if I, if I were a product manager and I had said to a developer, I want to get a list of friends and I wanted to have you know, their picture and a little bio and I want that in the sidebar of my application, I'm not sure I could look at this and say, oh yeah, yeah, this does that, right? Um, another tool that's come out is something called RDoc. Again, this is a swagger definition, believe it or not. Now, this is also n not very uh, user-friendly, depending on what user it is. If I'm a tester, I'm actually going to love this because our doc has a lot of different views. You can toggle between like sequence diagrams. This happens to be a relationship diagram. It can also, you can add in your, your web components. So you can look at your entire web application in this view and see where the web components are calling the APIs, um, which APIs are dependent on other APIs. So this gives you a, a nice map of all the different interactions. But again, if I'm a developer or a tester, I would probably really like this. It's again not going to answer that question for the product manager. But here's a company. This is a, a company that is uh, a new startup that's been around for, I think, maybe five months, five, six months, called LucyBot. Um, it's named after their dog, believe it or not. Um, they have a dog named Lucy. Um, and this, they actually recognize that an API description, if you're going to onboard to an API, 
you actually need to do it at a couple of different levels. If you're a developer, you want to see code snippets, right? You want to be able to, to develop your own cookbook based on what language you use. You want to see the JSON um, output, and you want, you want to actually be able to do some payload analysis. If you're a product manager, what you want is the view over here that says, I asked for a friends list with a little bit of bio. Oh, yeah, it does that. Right, so LucyBot, when you use LucyBot as an API provider, you actually identify what are my use cases, and then you give it a little bit of HTML for each one of those use cases, and you have this view as part of your onboarding documentation. So I think that LucyBot comes closer to actually visualizing your API than some of the other solutions. But it's something to keep in mind. Again, this is Swagger-based, so if you're starting with Swagger, you can end up with this kind of view of your API, which I think is very powerful if, you're, if you've got an API that you want to speak to both the business and the development community. So this is visualizing, so that's great. You've, you've created some sort of visual representation of your API depending on who you want to talk to. Um, the next thing you really need to do is do some testing. So if you say your API is going to do something, it should do that. Uh, again, this is a competitive environment now. There are a lot of people out there with a lot of APIs. And there are more and more organizations that are adopting third-party APIs. It used to be that that was kind of a you know, a dangerous thing to do. And so people, companies that were more risk averse wouldn't use third party APIs. They were always building their own. That kind of not invented here mentality is starting to go away. People is becoming much more common to use third party APIs. And that means that you need to really make sure that your API works the way you say it's going to, because people have choices. Um, more and more people will ask you for service level agreements. So you need to make sure that your API is robust enough and that you have a way to communicate when there are bug fixes or changes. You want to load test your API. So this can be a little complicated in the API world. It's much easier, much more cut and dry when you're in the application world. At the API level, you may have, it depends on what kind of API you have and how you're exposing it, what kind of load testing you want to do. So if you, you're building an API for internal consumption, and that's the reality is the majority of APIs are only used internally, um, then you have a known set of users. You know how many people are going to hit your API. You basically know your business, or at least you can find out, so you know when the peak times are. You can set up a load test that is very tuned to the user population of your API. Make sure that it can hold up under peak times. You'll probably want to set up some, some burst tests to make sure that when people all come online in the morning and they start using your API, that your API doesn't fall over. If you're building an API for partner consumption, you're going to have to learn a little bit about what those partners are doing and how many people are they exposing their application to. What, you know, is it a global application? When do people come online? What is their, right, so now you have a, a known set of partners. What's their population on the other end of that? Because that's all load against your API. So you're going to want to develop a strategy that works across the board for the variety of partners you might have. Where it gets really tricky is if you've got a public API. So if you're just putting your API out there and, and evangelizing it and trying to make sure people are adopting it, their success could be your demise, right? So you want to make sure that you are doing a lot of load testing for a variety of scenarios and probably doing it simultaneously. So you want to do some ramp tests, you want to do some burst tests. You want to make sure that you can hit all of these different models that the public might be doing. Um, because it's kind of the wild, wild west out there. You, you have no idea what's going to happen. And the more people who use your API and are successful with it, the more load that's going to hit your API. So um, you not only want to make sure that you're 
you're finding your threshold and communicating it, but you also want to make sure that you're putting some rate limits in place so that you can throttle some of that traffic. And uh, look at some real user statistics. So this is where monitoring can help you. If you're monitoring the usage of your API, you can use a lot of that data to figure out where the usage is coming from, how heavy is it, and start modeling your load test based on real usage of your API. Uh, how many people security test their API? Oh, more than one person, that's great. Uh, I often ask that question at conferences and get very few hands go up, and actually there are only a couple of people. Um, so I can't say this enough. You have a responsibility in this industry, we all do, to make sure that what we build is secure and safe to use. So APIs are, uh, you know, it's like drilling a little hole in the dike, and what you don't want to do is create this security uh, vulnerability. And we see it on the news all the time. This is happening all the time because people are not thinking about it. Um, there's a great website, awasp.org, that has uh, the top 10 ways that people hack your API. I suggest you all look at it and at least do those 10 tests. If you're, if you're not securing the data that's behind your API, then you are failing your audience. Um, when, I, when I say that, I want to emphasize that just running security tests, like you know, checking to see if, uh, SQL injection, you know, do you have any vulnerabilities if somebody tries to, tries to hack your API through SQL injection? Are they throwing an XML bomb if you've got an XML uh, API, but more importantly, you want to look at your payload. Do some payload analysis because people can hack your API without actually hacking your API. If you're delivering back data that people can use maliciously, and I don't know how many people have heard of Tinder. Nobody. Okay, so Tinder is a hookup app, right? So people can find other people who are nearby. Um, when it first came out, it Actually, the API delivered your exact geolocation. Now, the client hid that and said, oh, she's about a half a mile away from you. But that was the client hiding that. The API was actually saying, she's exactly right there. Right? It's very dangerous. And so, of course, you know, that got very public. They fixed it. Um, and they, they actually fixed it in a way that you could still figure out where they were. So it took them a couple of fixes. But, you know, the reality is this can be a very dangerous world, and you need to make sure that you're looking at your payload and not delivering data that people can use maliciously. Um, and then virtualize. So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about virtualization, like I said earlier. Virtualization and mocking, kind of one and the same. Um, why would you virtualize your APIs? So one reason is because you are uh, bootstrapping your development. So you're, you're working on your API, you're building your API at the same time that you need to start thinking about how to test your API. If you're in an agile environment, that's very common. Um, you can create a, a virtual API or a mock, one and the same, so that your testers know what your API does and they can start building their tests so when your API is available to them, they're ready to go. Um, if you want to isolate, I'm going to start speeding up a little bit because I'm running out of time, but if you want to isolate your API, um, so for example, you are actually testing an application and so what you want to do is, is virtualize the APIs you depend on so that you can focus on testing the application itself without having the API actually be the thing you're testing. So in, in a lot of worlds, you want to deliver a virtual version of your API to your third-party development teams. So if you have partners who are using your API, you give them a virtual version of your API so they can do their own sandboxing. And load testing. If you're load testing an application, so if those of you who are providing APIs, probably the last thing you actually want to have happen is that somebody's building a, an application using your API and they decide to load test their application, which, oh, by the way, is also going to load test your API. Uh, 
and, and load test your API in production. So you really don't want that to happen. If you create a virtual version of the API and give them access to that, then they can do their own load testing without hitting your production API. Uh, and then providing a sandbox, which is really just, here's my API, uh, here's my documentation, go play with it. You know, this is this is a way for people to onboard without actually experimenting with your production environment. So what kind of, of virtualization is there? So I've been saying mocks. Um, there is such a thing as static mock. So a static mock is a great solution for if you're trying to provide something to your test team, for example, so they can just see what it does. A static mock, really, it's, it's you give it a request, it gives you back a response. It's an expected response. It's a known response. There's nothing dynamic about this. Um, I say foo, you say bar. Cool. And then the test team can at least build their test framework around that. Um, then there's something called dynamic mocks. Dynamic mocks give you a little bit more versatility. So you may want to hook a data source up to this so that you can get some varied responses from it. Um, this is a good way to do sandboxing, for example. If third-party developers want to just kind of play around, they want to get a variety of responses. So you can set up a sandbox environment and use dynamic mocks to help them with that. And then there's something that we in, in SmartBear that we call virtual APIs. So those are a little different than a mock. It's sort of a mock on steroids, because you can do all the same things with a virtual API that you can do with a mock, but you can also manipulate the back end. So you can do some simulations of sort of server capacity, uh, bandwidth. You can uh, generate different kinds of failure codes. So you can do some back end simulation that gives you that much more testing power. And then lastly, you want to make sure you're doing your monitoring. So monitoring protects your production API in a lot of ways. You can keep an eye on the performance of your API, make sure that it's staying um, in the SLA region that you've defined or that your partners expect from you. Um, monitoring isn't just for your own APIs. If you are relying on a third-party API, you should monitor that as well. Because what you don't want to do is find out from your users that an API you're relying on is not performing, is either down or is too slow. So if you're monitoring that API, then you can tell whether or not your application is compromised. It also gives you a chance to kind of do plan B. Um, so, you know, in the intro, that they mentioned that I worked at kayak.com. Kayak.com is a travel website, very popular in the U.S. We relied on APIs exclusively. So if you wanted to search for flights, we hit the APIs for a whole bunch of airlines. What we didn't want was for our website to sit there and look blank, right? We need responses and we need them fast. So we actually had a whole lot of fallback uh, built into our system. So if the Marriott API didn't come back fast enough, cool, we'll go to Hotels.com. If that doesn't come back fast enough, we'll go somewhere else. We'll just keep hitting. We, we would send out asynchronous calls, and we would make sure that if you were too slow to respond, you fell to the bottom. Because what we couldn't allow was for our website to be compromised by a slow API. So you want to set up this kind of monitoring so you know how to code defensively around that. So if you remember nothing else, uh, visualize, validate, virtualize, and monitor. Those are sort of the four key pieces to making sure that your API is great.